interpretation at the bottom of your screen. All right, so after defining gender-based violence yesterday and discussing the key indicators and general guidelines, we'll focus today on the, um, we'll have a more detailed discussion on the sources to uh, get data on gender-based violence, uh, namely mostly on uh, administrative data and the survey data. Uh, we have a, we're very lucky to have a number of speakers today that uh, will discuss this topic. Um, so the first part will be on the survey, on the use of surveys to collect data on gender-based violence uh, with three speakers, and then we'll have uh, my colleague Martin who will talk about the use of administrative data, uh, mostly, uh, uh, yeah, mostly our uh, criminal justice uh, system data for his presentation. So I encourage you to ask your questions in the Q and um, box that you can find at the bottom of the screen. Uh, ask your questions after the presentations. We'll try to uh, to respond to most of your questions. Uh, however, now uh, before we go ahead with the presentations, uh, we're very lucky that um, Jessica Garner accepted to come back today to join the webinar, and uh, she'll respond to uh, your question or to the questions you had yesterday. Uh, Jessica, I can you can you take the floor? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, David. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Uh, pleasure to meet, uh, join you again. Thank you for the questions from yesterday's session where we looked at uh, what is gender-based violence and, and how to measure it. Um, there were so many great questions and I've just, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to come back and answer a few of them to start off the session today. And just to acknowledge that we are talking about measurement of a very sensitive and difficult issue. So do uh, take care of yourselves as we discuss these, these forms of violence. Um, let me, I have for just a few minutes, I won't be able to answer all the questions that were posed yesterday, but I have some on some slides so you can see the questions that were asked and some of the answers that I've formulated and I'm, I'll be coming back to the other questions to, as follow up to this, um, this webinar series. We talked about different data sources yesterday and the main data sources are administrative data and surveys as will be discussed further today uh, but there's also emerging forms of data like citizen generated data and Julie asked um, what, are, what kinds of data can be used in this space very good question. It is a very new kind of form of data that's increasingly gaining um, traction as a source of data that can complement official statistics. I'm not aware of very many examples in the space of gender-based violence, but there's a couple of links there to um, using technology to map violent hotspots in a city, for example, where citizens are adding that information for the benefit of everyone. And there was also an attempt in Mexico to map femicides to fill gaps in data there but very emerging source and interesting for us to watch that space um, another question that was posed is is gender-based violence prevalent in workplaces um, i think the answer to that is yes it is an issue certainly in workplaces but measuring that is a relatively new area where we don't have um, international standards yet the ilo is taking the lead on that there's a, a convention, uh, 190, that countries are signing up to, to eliminate violence and harassment in the workplace. And alongside that, the Department of Statistics at the ILO is looking into how countries have been doing this and what might be some international standards for measuring the experiences that men and women have in the workplace um, around violence. So another area to watch. Somebody observed that um, most of the data that we were talking about yesterday was around physical or um, sexual violence, but not a lot about economic or psych psychological violence. I wanted to emphasise that in the prevalent surveys, those forms of violence are also measured as well as controlling behaviours. We often end up talking about physical and or sexual violence because the standards and definitions around those forms of violence are a bit more robust and comparable across countries. But the other forms of violence are incredibly important to understand um, people's experiences. So there, there are data on that. Um, 
Christy asked if there has been data collected on child sexual abuse and exploitations and what are the challenges and difficulties with collecting such data. Uh, certainly a very challenging area of measurement. Um, and I'm by no means an expert in this space and I've put some links to um, WHO and UNICEF where you can find more information. But the prevalence surveys that uh, measure violence against women collect data from women and girls age 15 and above. So there's some data on um, young girls, girls aged below 18, but usually in the sample, that's a small number. So there is limitations on what we can get from those data sources. But more importantly to say that dedicated prevalence surveys do ask women and girls that are interviewed, they never interview children, but they do ask the women and girls about their experiences as a child with child sexual abuse. And we can see some data here from the Mongolia survey in 2017, which found that around 11% of women in that sample had experienced child sexual abuse. And um, we we're able to find a little bit more information about um, that in terms of who had perpetrated the violence against them. And finally, uh, there was a question um, from Yassir Ali Khan on whether Pakistani data was included in those figures that we were showing yesterday. Yes, it is included in both the Asia Pacific Regional Snapshot and the WHO Global Prevalence Estimates. Pakistan conducted um, a module with their Demographic and Health Survey in 2017, and you can access the link there. And finally, um, Adelaide Mukashev had asked about the reluctance of governments to measure gender-based violence, and I'd started to answer that question yesterday, but I wanted to come back to some of the approaches that have worked to really bring governments um, um, to convince them and encourage them uh, into measuring gender-based violence. Briefing them on the methods and standards is really crucial so they understand what is being measured and how involving policy and decision makers in every stage of the process um, so that they are engaged and have ownership and also finding and using champions and advocates has been very successful. Many opportunities to create, um, to create many opportunities to sensitize people to, to the methods and, and also providing information on the costs of violence can be uh, very convincing. Thank you, back to you, David. Thank you very much, Jessica. Um, and I think I hope that the participant also uh, appreciated to have the, the responses to the questions. Um, so we'll now uh, start with the presentation. So yesterday, Jessica started to introduce different sources uh, on uh, gender-based violence. And uh, today, Yunko Lee, uh, data specialist in uh, UN Women, will uh, talk further about the use of surveys to collect data on gender-based violence, looking at uh, the different information that uh, are collected, uh, the methodological choices and the relevant guidelines. Yunko, uh, is, you can take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me just quickly share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, I'm not in present. Okay, now we can see it fully. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, David uh, and colleagues uh, for having me here. Um, uh, it's my good, great pleasure. Uh, as David mentioned, for the next 15 minutes, um, briefly, I'm going to talk about some of the methodologies and tools used to collect you know, gender-based violence data by using surveys. So as you can see, uh, there, there are various sources of data available on violence against women. Uh, so the two most common are data from admin data, which includes records from the health and social services and police, et cetera. The other one is the data collected from surveys, which normally go through uh, rigorous statistical procedures to make sure that the sample is representative of the entire uh, population you're trying to measure. Uh, in regards to estimating the uh, the, the prevalence of uh, violence of, of, of violence against women, as shown on the uh, in the diagram on the screen, 
admin data cannot provide an estimate of the true uh, prevalence of violence against women because only a small portion of acts of violence are reported. So studies in many countries show that uh, among women who have ever experienced violence by an intimate partner, uh, less than 10% seek uh, help from these support services. So as for the population-based surveys, uh, if they are well-designed, uh, the survey can collect the best data uh, possible on prevalence and patterns of violence in the populations that you're trying to study. However, violence against women surveys only measure those who are willing and able to disclose uh, their experiences uh, rather than measuring the actual number of women who have, who have ever been abused. So the accuracy uh, of the survey results uh, actually depend on the respondent's uh, willingness to, to disclose uh, very personal information. So SDG 5.2 measures the proportion of intimate partner violence, you know, and surveys are the only tools that can be used to collect data for calculating these indicators. Uh, so there are two ways of uh, measuring uh, the above data from the surveys. Uh, the first one is using the dedicated surveys uh, that are specifically designed to gather detailed information uh, on different types of violence against women. Uh, the second approach includes the uh, adding a short module on violence against women to existing uh, large-scale surveys, such as DHS and MIX, uh, which are designed to generate information on broader issues such as uh, crime, poverty, or health. For example, DHS uh, or the uh, uh, they both have a, a, a module dedicated to, to measure the violence against women. Uh, uh, so if properly conducted, uh, dedicated surveys should provide the most reliable statistic on, on violence against women. Uh, dedicated surveys are more flexible in the sense that uh, they can include uh, a large number of detailed questions specifically on violence against women. And sample design is ta also tailored to, to meet the survey objectives. And interviewers are carefully selected uh, to deal with sensitive topics and maximize the uh, disclosure of violence. Uh, but the, the downside of the, uh, the dedicated surveys is that they are very costly and difficult for countries to conduct on a regular basis uh, to, due to budget constraints. So adding a module on violence against women to existing survey is obviously much less costly, uh, costly approach, but the questionnaire and sample design must be adjusted to, to fit the host survey requirements. Uh, so as for the interviewers, in addition to the requirements of the host survey, uh, they also need to specify, uh, satisfy the specific criteria uh, set out for conducting the, uh, the, the bio modules. So what types of violence uh, get collected in a survey? Um, ideally, the ultimate goal is actually to measure all forms of violence against women, uh, death being the extreme case of uh, uh, violence. However, uh, there are, uh, the methodological development uh, has not advanced far enough to capture all such violences. So the, the current UN guidelines recommend the, the following four core topics to be included in a survey on violence against women. And, this gui uh, and the guidelines also just suggest optional topics and countries have the option of including any of the optional topics suggested as well as any other topic uh, which are relevant uh, based on their specific circumstances and policy needs. So as you can see from the screen, uh, uh, under each type of violence, there are a list of acts of violence, uh, which are just the minimum list for countries to use, and they can be certainly expanded as appropriate in each country context. In a survey situation, um, it's a good idea to provide a detailed list of different acts of violence as shown on the screen, rather than just asking a general question about the violence. Uh, which can have misinterpretation based on uh, subjective perceptions. So these topics are based on the data requirements of the list of core indicators uh, identified by the Friends of the Chair of the UN Statistical Commission, uh, uh, which I will show you on the next slide. So in 2006, the UN General Assembly requested the uh, UN Statistical Commission 
to develop a set of possible indicators on violence against women uh, to assist the UN member states in assessing the scope and the prevalence and the incidence of violence against women. For this purpose, a working group uh, named the Friends of Chair was formed uh, by the, the, the Statistical Commission in 2008. And this group proposed the core set of uh, indicators as shown on the screen. And they were adopted in 2011. So as you can see, the core indicators are based on the four core topics mentioned in the previous slide. So they, the two are interrelated. Um, so they are basically uh, divided into physical, sexual, uh, psychological, economical, the four core topics, right? The, the last one, uh, the last indicator is, is related to the female genital mutilation. Uh, although this is not one of the core indicators identified by the Friends of Chair, uh, nevertheless, it's, it's, a white, uh, uh, it's a very important indicator that needs to be measured, that it overlaps. It's not only just, it, it, it is a physical, uh, sexual, and also psychological uh, um, uh, violence that is, uh, exists in a very extreme form. But it's not a widespread phenomenon in many countries, so that's why it's an optional uh, core topic. Uh, in terms of uh, regarding the mode of data collection, face-to-face uh, -face interviewing is the most common method of conducting surveys on violence against women. Uh, but they are costly since it requires the it requires the interviewers to to travel to to households to collect the data. So, but they can employ various technologies such as CAPI and CASI to ask the respondents to complete the sensitive questions in a very private and safe manner. Uh, sampling involves multi-stage cluster sam sampling usually to ensure that we have a representative sample and the size of sample can, but the size of the sample can be limited uh, due to budget. Uh, once the interviewers and the respondents build rapport, uh, Respondents tend to tolerate longer interviews and which lead to higher participation rates. Uh, telephone interviewing is useful when there's a situation where in-person interviews, interviews are not possible as we have seen during the pandemic. Uh, it can provide more privacy to respondents as others in the household are unable to hear the questions being posed, uh, thus ensuring that uh, the safety of the uh, of the respondents. However, this is only true when proper ethical and safe uh, safety guidelines are observed. Um, also, telephone interviewing is only used in locations where telephone coverage is uh, complete or or almost complete. Which otherwise, this can result in a very uh, uh, biased uh, uh, responses. But nevertheless, this can result in a very substantial cost savings. Uh, compared to face-to-face -face surveys, uh, the refusal rates are higher since respondents uh, tend to be less tolerant uh, of long interviews over the phone. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, telephone surveys are useful when in-person when in interviewing uh, is not possible. Uh, such as you, uh, such as the one in the during the pandemic. Uh, however, this can undermine the, um, the safety of women because women may may be at home with their abusers, and the interview trigger uh, could trigger more violence, or they might be afraid to disclose their experience. Uh, to address this problem, uh, UN Women recently uh, produced a guidance on collecting vow data. To, uh, through uh, telephone surveys based on the uh, rapid gender assessment surveys conducted in uh, 13 countries during the pandemic. Uh, the guidance introduced how innovations can make it possible to collect uh, VAO data over the phone in a safe, uh, in a safe and ethical manner. Uh, there are several innovations, but I'm just going to mention uh, two of them uh, uh, in, in light of the, uh, the limited time I have. Uh, one of the innovation mentioned in the guidance is the use of bigness. With bigness, uh, respondents hear a story about a specific topic, for example, about partner abuse as shown on the screen. Uh, and they are asked to reflect on their thoughts uh, regarding the story, whether they think such a situation is common in the area they live. Uh, 
Although VietNets can be a good tool for community level measurement of, uh, of violence against women, uh, we should be mindful that, that these data do not provide specific prevalence estimates for the for violence against women, as they are not direct, uh, direct uh, these are indirect, they are not direct measures of violence against women. So we should be very careful in terms of using this, uh, uh, these estimates coming from this method. Uh, the other innovation introduced in the guidance is the list randomization. Uh, basically, uh, respondents are randomly divided into two groups, and, and they are given the same short list of statements and asked how many statements are applicable or are true. The other group received the uh, same list of statements and one additional statement designed to capture the uh, sensitive behavior. In our example, the additional statement is the, is the statement that, uh, in the dotted square box. It says, I have been slapped or hit by my husband or partner before the onset of COVID-19. So that's our sensitive behavior we're trying to measure. Uh, so then after that, then you subtract the mean of true statements. The respondent said yes of the two groups. And that difference should give a rough estimate of the proportion of respondents uh, that experienced uh, uh, the uh, uh, violence against women. So both methods can be useful, VIPNETs and risk randomization can be useful tools to capture indirect measures of, uh, of VAL because women, women might be hesitant to, to report their own experience of violence when, they're, uh, when directly asked such uh, difficult questions. Uh, another thing that we have to keep in mind is that when implementing any survey to collect file data, there are ethical and safety challenges that we need to keep in mind. Uh, so WHO has uh, developed this uh, publication, uh, Putting Women First, recommendations that lay out some of the key principles that should guide research on domestic violence. Uh, the recommendation talks about the importance of ensuring the safety of respondents uh, ensuring methodological soundness to minimize underreporting, protecting confidentiality, the need to receive uh, specialized training and ongoing support uh, for team members, and, and reducing any possible distress caused by participants by the research or the survey, uh, referring women, uh, requesting assistance to available local services, ensuring that their findings are properly interpreted and used to advance policy and intervention development. And finally, uh, violence questions should only be incorporated, incorporated into surveys designed for other purposes only when ethical and uh, when and only if ethical and methodological requirements can be met. Otherwise, it tends to reduce women's willingness to, dis, uh, to disclose, uh, which negatively affects the prevalence rates uh, that we're trying to measure. Um, so, uh, finally, I, I would like to conclude my presentation by introducing some of the relevant um, uh, guidelines I have used to prepare this presentation. Uh, first, the WHO uh, multi-country study on women's health and domestic violence. This is a very important study. This is the first study to provide uh, uh, the comparable data from culturally diverse countries on the prevalence and, uh, and the frequency of different forms of VAL. Uh, and this study is powerful because this sort of like sets the global standard on collecting VAL data by survey. And it's now internationally uh, accepted uh, best practice for collecting VAL data through surveys. Uh, the Putting Women First, uh, it, it was developed for conducting the, the WHO's health and violence studies. And this recommendation provide details on the planning and implementation and dissemination of research, particularly through surveys. Uh, finally, the U UN Statistical Division has developed the guidelines for producing a statistic on violence against women. And these guidelines provide comprehensive recommendations uh, on the concepts, definitions, and data requirements needed for measuring uh, violence against women. Uh, including all aspects related to planning, organization, and, and implementation of survey uh, and dissemination of the findings. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions that you might have. Thank you.
Back to you, David. Yeah, thank you so much, Junko, for, for your detailed presentation and also going over the, the main choices uh, to, to, to take uh, when implementing a survey and, and presenting the different considerations to take into account. Um, we'll take the questions a little bit later uh, after the three presentations on surveys, uh, but in the meantime, you can maybe already enter them in the Q&A box below. Um, I just also want to remind participants that we'll share all the material and the recording of the meeting um, of, of the, the three webinars on uh, Friday or early next week. Um, now we'll, we'll uh, continue with our next presentation um, from uh, Maria Neves, who's a statistician in uh, UNDP. And uh, she'll present on the SDG 16 survey initiative, uh, which is a uh, Questionnaire and an implementation manual to uh, monitor some uh, SDG indicators of goal 16. Mariana, you have the floor, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much, and thank you for the very informative uh, presentation from uh, Yonko and uh, Jessica's qualifications. I really missed uh, yesterday. Um, so I hope. Uh, uh, now I really feel sad that I was not able to join, um, but thank you for this opportunity. I'll be speaking on the SDG 16 survey initiative, uh, as David said, which is a joint uh, initiative by UNDP, UNODC, and OSHR. So the three agencies in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals started to work together, progressively working together, harmonizing our practices, uh, our actions as much as possible. Uh, it being that the core part of this is the SDGs. And uh, as we have been working on SDGs, all of us, we found that, that we barely have uh, any data on SDG 16. You see the three indicators in your screen at this moment. These three indicators, uh, they are not survey-based indicators. We have two UNODC indicators there and one OSHR indicator. Uh, so we have the first two administrative records and the, the last one is an assessment that provides information. And there's not a lot more that we have information at the global level. It's sufficient to have a global level. But the, on the other side, we found that uh, the three agencies together, they had covered a considerable amount of indicators. So the statistical units and the institutions themselves, they have already accumulated a really vast uh, knowledge and they are responsible for uh, collecting, which means we are responsible to request the NSOs to provide information, but we are also responsible for methodological development, for support. Uh, and among us, we have uh, around seven uh, indicators, which are administrative sources that we have, as I said, a better coverage. Uh, but we also have, um, several more <laughs> indicators, now all on household survey, which the three of us, uh, either one or the other. And here our, our coverage is very low. So it was not one agency, it was not automatic. This is, was very general. And uh, I must say that, and this is important, that we, since the beginning of SDGs, uh, we, where there was uh, absolute, uh, almost no methodology, no standard, we had the indicators, but for a lot of indicators, we did not know how to do it. Some we have a little bit more. From that point to where we are now, to, uh, since uh, yesterday, we have 39.8% of countries having been uh, produced at least one SG16 indicator. This is an average of the average produced by MSD. So, that's made us say uh, we have to focus on the survey. And here, I know this is very small for you to read, uh, but it's just to illustrate. So wherever you see the blue, there are the indicators that the survey produces. Uh, and whenever you see the darker blue, whenever you see the lighter blue, there are it, uh, administrative record indicators that one of the agency produces. So we decided, given this context, 
uh, and given all the demand and the request that the three agencies have from the member states from Europe uh, to start developing a service, something that will resolve the several problems. One of them, we have too many operations. Uh, there is certain we work, which is very similar uh, dialogue, but it's not the same. Uh, and we need to harmonize. So we, we went, started a two year process just before COVID. Uh, to develop the methodology for the SDG 16 survey, we had extensive desk review of several national experiences, uh, national, regional, global experiences. Uh, we had an expert consultation where several countries have uh, went through, after we had first draft of the questionnaire, went through and uh, criticized, gave uh, gave uh, their opinion. In some cases, they said, okay, it's perfect. In some cases, they said, you have to remove or you change. There are parts that maybe we were not, it was not as refined as it should be. So we went through this, and then we went through a cognitive testing uh, on three countries because uh, the first presenter, she was saying, you have to be careful. And she said something that uh, she said, uh, for us to be careful uh, while we had, we discuss this. So this was a real concern for us when we were developing this G16 survey because we don't want to denumerate this to be uh, re-victimized by the experience. So we went through that was a part that uh, we uh, have saw not only the how the enumerators, uh, sorry, the interviewers were accepting the or receiving the questionnaire, but also the enumerators themselves. And that allowed us to learn uh, how best to proceed, small adjustments. A lot of our adjustments was on the, not so much the questionnaire, but on the process of survey implementation itself. So uh, one of the slides that I saw before, uh, which is where we base is practices, cautions, uh, alerts that they should have. Uh, so that's one part. Once we concluded that, we went through piloting. And in the piloting phase, we had eight countries with a very, very different context. We had a small island developed state, Cape Verde. We have very uh, big country like Kazakhstan. We had Tunisia, uh, Somalia, we said conflict affected countries. So it was a very diverse. And the models, uh, they, the survey behaved differently on the, depending on the countries. But I must confess that initially we, was, we believed that we have a lot of resistance uh, from the sexual violence part. It was not as much as we, as we initially thought. So we had some cases, uh, this was, uh, part of Tunisia uh, because on sexual violence it also measures on males uh, they, they were reluctant uh, they, they, we were informed that uh, and especially because the piloting was in a conservative area this is not the type of question we should make the, the national entities told us that it was too sensitive but when we went to piloting uh, although it was very sensitive, and we did this in a very particular context because the pilots went to the field, uh, started the field at the end of the lockdown. For instance, Tunisia pilot who went through two lockdowns while we were piloting. Uh, but despite all this, the 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 both the enumerators, then the interview, uh, the the interviewers, the national statistics office, the national stakeholders and the interviewees uh, themselves, they really received uh, the operation very well. Um, so, and so after all of this very important and very feedback that we received from the several, uh, several phases, we started designing what then would be this package, which is the survey, which is the implementation manual. So as I said before, for us, we saw that more and more it was important not only provide the guidelines, they have the questionnaire, but also the guidelines that help the national certificate officers or another implementing agency uh, 
in going and actually implementing, we prepare the data capture software. So is the software that the, you can put the questionnaire after you adapt to your country, because you always have to adapt a little bit uh, for your country. I can give you an ex uh, example. For the discrimination model, uh, we, one of the areas that we did the, the piloting, they did not have a word for discrimination. So that, that made a, a particular, uh, particular challenge that had to be addressed. So we had all of this. We have the, once you have this, uh, you adapt uh, the tabulation and the, the full methodology was endorsed or was welcomed by the United Nations Statistical Commission last year. So since the last year, that's when we started in a more uh, robust implementation. Certain characteristics have already been said. Remembering that this survey is not to, and I'm, I should have emphasized this before, uh, the survey is not to measure gender-based violence, but it measures several important parts. So it was not designed with that main concern uh, in mind. So one of the things you'll see is that the target population is a little bit different. It's a little bit older. Uh, we use randomization, we use several of the guidelines, uh, it's the same for the survey. Uh, we use face-to-face -face interviewing, uh, even though we were in COVID, we had some uh, uh, telephone interviewing. In those cases, we removed the sexual violence, all of the rest maintained, but sexual violence was removed from the, the questionnaire. Sorry. So now that I spoke a lot of what it is, I, I missed what exactly are we measuring. So this SDG 16 survey uh, has access to dispute resolution mechanisms. So what you see here, each one is a model. So we have access to dispute resolution mechanism. Uh, we have bribery, you know, this uh, leading discrimination, OSHR, uh, governance and satisfaction of public service, external political efficacy, that's mostly uh, NDP. Violence, that's your no disease. So you already have elements that were mentioned before. It will measure physical violence, sexual violence, and psychological violence. Being the psychological violence is a very new part of it. It will measure safety, sexual and non-sexual harassment, violence reporting. And we also have a last model on human trafficking. So where does this relate to, to gender-based violence? In the crossing, of the several parts, there are, we don't, again, we, this was not our primary uh, objective when designing, but the survey ends up providing a lot of information that are part of a gender-based violence. So, uh, and they create uh, the intimate part of violence, they created this, this new segment um, that if the country is going to decide to, to try to, to use the SG system survey to measure, then we have to take this in consideration in the very early phase of design of the next questionnaire. So for the implementation, the, and when I say take into consideration, there are three options that the survey currently has. One is, the first option is a full implementation. A full implementation, that means that for that specific country, we are going to collect all models that are presented, uh, all sections inside the model. So this is solutions, in mostly in the cases that the, as the, the country does not have any information on SDG 16 and requires urgently this information. A second, uh, a second option is a merger. This is a solution that's been used mostly in Africa because there is a governance, peace, and security survey. So what we did is using the base, the governance, peace, and security, we uh, realigned the material so the survey is able to collect the SG indicators. Well, I can give you one specific example. This, uh, for the bribery, GPS uh, before collected uh, the government security survey collected if the person were uh, was a victim of bribery but did not measure contact. So we need contact, because a, which is a part of the guidelines of the SDC system survey. So that's a, a B option. Uh, 
A C option is what was mentioned before in the, the, the percentages before me, uh, is you might not need the entire survey because if you have done a, a, a victimization survey already, you have done a corruption survey already, uh, it might not make sense for you to just, if you just done it to do these models, uh, because both the victimization survey, the corruption, so they are very, very, very robust and strong methodologies. Uh, While these indicators, they are giving a very limited part of the, the phenomenon. So that, there's just reasons. Sometimes is what we happen with El Salvador, uh, and is we see it increasingly happening. Uh, we don't have the full uh, the full funds. So in El Salvador, what they end up doing, they collected uh, discrimination first, just a model discrimination, because they had a continuous survey. In the next uh, next data collection, they did access to justice. This is also, but more or less, the same scheme that South Africa uses. So they, in the long run, they will collect everything, but they keep one by one, collect as much as possible. So this is the SD16 survey, and uh, you see the three contacts uh, here. There, you there is much more. But uh, there is the three contests, uh, Maurice for Minority C, there's Nicholas from OSHR, there's myself from the UNDP. Any questions you can ask us today, uh, we'll, I'll put the, the link in the chat, but you can also contact any of the three of the agencies later on if you have uh, any questions or you find something you want to contribute or do something that you think we should do better. Uh, thank you so much, David. Thank you very much, Mariana, for presenting uh, on the SDG 16 survey initiative, which also uh, gives an additional option uh, for countries to monitor SDG 16 indicators, including the ones on uh, violence. Um, we'll take your questions a little bit uh, later, dear participants. Um, and I also want to, to remind you that we'll share the presentations and the recordings online after the meeting. Uh, we'll now go to our next presentation, uh, which will be on the uh, crime victimization surveys uh, done by the uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics. Anthea Saflekos, Assistant Director at the National Center for Crime and Justice Statistics in the Australian Bureau of Statistics, will uh, present uh, on this topic. Hi, David. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for um, having me here today. Um, so I work in a team that looks after the population crime surveys in Australia. We have two surveys that we run, the Crime Victimisation Survey, um, which is an annual survey, and we also have the Personal Safety Survey, which is similar in content to a Violence Against Women survey and helps our understanding of gender-based uh, violence. So today I'd like to briefly uh, cover with you some background information about the two surveys, um, the methodologies, and also some data uses. Then um, we'll take a look at some data from our most recent personal safety survey um, with the data that just came out in March this year. Okay, so before we get into it, I just wanted to draw your attention to um, the broader crime and justice program at the ABS. So we use both administrative byproduct data as well as crime data um, from surveys to paint a picture of crime and safety in Australia. So from the admin side, we have police data, criminal courts data and corrective services just focus on the green ones today, but we'll have some links at the end of this presentation if you do want to have a look at some of our other collections. Okay. So the first survey is the Crime Victimisation Survey. Um, this measures really high level uh, personal and household crime types. So the ones that are probably most of interest to hear today is the physical assault, um, sexual assault uh, crimes that we collect in this survey, but we also have other um, victimization rates for household crimes like break-in, um, theft of a motor vehicle, theft from a motor vehicle as well. 
we collect this information primarily for um, our police so that they can have a better understanding of all the crimes that are being experienced in Australia. They get the reported crime, so this kind of completes the picture and shows that unreported uh, nature of the crimes. So what's really critical about this data set is being able to measure changes over time. So we can look year on year and see if there's any trends or if there's a decline. So we've seen over the last 10 years, a decline in physical assault, for example. Um, what else is really important is we collect information about the most recent incident. So that will tell us information about who the perpetrator was, what happened in the incident, whether drugs or alcohol were used, um, and whether the incident was reported to police and reasons for not reporting to police. The other key piece of information that this survey collects is um, information about the, the victim. So how old are they? What, are they male or are they female? Um, and then some other demographics, such as their employment, education, income. Again, that just shows a bit of a profile of the risk factors, like who's more likely to experience violence. So how do we run this survey? So as I mentioned before, this is run annually um, and it's been running since 2008. We interview people aged 15 years and over, although um, only people aged 18 years and over are asked the sexual assault question because of the sensitivity around that. Um, it's a telephone interview and about 28,000 people are interviewed. The questionnaire is actually very, very short. It's only two minutes, so it sits on a broader survey. Um, we call it the multi-purpose household survey. Essentially, it sits on our labour force survey. Um, and that, that runs for 12 months of the year. And we start in July each year and we uh, go all the way to June. And then we spend about six months processing the data um, and publishing in February the following year. Okay, so the next survey they want to talk about is the personal safety survey. This is our uh, most comprehensive survey on family and domestic violence. Um, it's been running since 1996 and approximately every four years. We were a little bit delayed this year, um, the 21-22 survey, uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but we finally got there and some results have come out in March this year. Um, so we interview people aged 18 years and over living in private households. The sample size is about 24,000 um, people and it's predominantly, oh, it's weighted more towards females. Um, safety of respondents is essential in this survey. So we have a whole heap of special procedures that we um, take so that we can make sure that the respondents feel safe to answer these questions. So for example, we make sure that they are um, interviewed in a private space um, so where no one else can hear the answers to the questions. Compared to the crime victimization survey, this one goes for 30 minutes. It's really, really long. Um, and I will show you now um, all the content that is collected in the survey. So we collect a whole raft of different uh, violence types from sexual and physical violence, cohabiting partner violence, partner emotional abuse and economic abuse, sexual harassment, stalking and general feelings of safety. We also ask about people's experiences of childhood abuse, um, but that is asked retrospectively of adults. So this information is really important. We have two um, timeframes here for measuring violence. So we have um, since the age of 15, which uh, tells us how many people in Australia or how many women in Australia have experienced these types of violence. And then we also collect information about um, incidents that happened in the last 12 months. And that information is really important for measuring changes over time between the two cycles. The other key piece of information that we have in this survey is the characteristics and outcome information. Uh, so a little bit like the um, crime victimization survey, but in a lot more detail, we'll ask about what happened in those most recent incidents of violence, whether they told the police services that were used, um, whether they had an injury or took time off work. 
For the partner violence, we ask about the frequency and the severity of outcomes, um, whether they went through the criminal justice system and the details around that. So that information is really important for policymakers to plan services and um, address family domestic violence. And the third key um, element of the personal safety survey is collecting information about uh, the respondent. So again, we collect a lot of socio-demographic characteristics around whether the, their sex, um, age profile, disability status, country of birth, sexual orientation, et cetera. And what we can see from the data is that certain groups are more likely to be experiencing um, these types of violence. Okay, so that's a bit of a background to the, uh, the two surveys. Now what I thought I would do is share with you some information about um, the most recent survey and the results. So we have um, two in five Australians have experienced physical or sexual violence. We can see that's about 43% of men and 39% of women. It's about the the same for both men and women in terms of experiencing violence. However, if you go to the next slide, we see a very different picture. So there is one in five women have experienced sexual violence since the age of 15. That's about 22% of Australians. And one in 16 men have experienced violence. That's about 6% of men. In terms of physical violence, what we can see here is that about four in 10 men have experienced uh, physical violence and about three in 10 women have experienced physical violence. Men are more likely to experience physical violence than women. However, when we break this down, we can see that the relationship to the perpetrator is very different. So we know that men are more likely to experience violence by a stranger as women are far more likely to experience this violence by an intimate partner in their home. So the next slide I have is um, the number of women who have experienced uh, cohabiting partner violence. That just means that they lived with the partner at the time of the violence. And we have one in six women in Australia have experienced um, physical or sexual violence by their partner. So that's 17% of women. Um, and one in 18 men have experienced partner violence. We also collect information on um, emotional abuse and economic abuse. I don't have a, a slide for that, but uh, the numbers are 23% of women who have, ex have experienced emotional abuse in their lifetime by a partner, and about 16% of women have experienced economic abuse. Okay. So the next slide, we change the time frame. So that the slides before, we're looking at how many people have ever experienced violence since the age of 15. Now we look at how many women have experienced violence in the last 12 months to measure that uh, rate against the 2016 survey. And what we found was a few differences. So um, similar to 2016 was physical violence, sexual violence and stalking. However, we did see a drop in cohabiting partner violence cohabiting partner emotional abuse and sexual harassment. Now, just a reminder, this survey was collected during the COVID-19 pandemic. So this might be a unique trend or we might be going down, like time will tell. But we have seen um, the Crime Victimization Survey also showed a similar trend for physical and sex, physical violence by a partner. And we've also seen some other findings um, internationally. So New Zealand and the US who measure similar uh, violence types also saw a decline during the beginning of the pandemic. And then the last slide is um, men's experiences in the last 12 months. We saw that physical violence remained stable during the last 12 months. Uh, and similar to women, we saw a decline in emotional abuse and sexual harassment. That's it. Thank you. And I just have some extra um, 
publication links here if anyone would like to go and have a look at the um, publications that I was just talking about. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, I will share, we'll share it with the participants after the week, the meeting. And I really encourage you, uh, you um, to uh, them to uh, check the different links uh, you've inserted in your presentation. Uh, we are, and uh, as you'll see in the next presentation by my colleague, are using uh, some of uh, your, your example and what you're doing uh, for your work. Um, so thank you for, for presenting on the crime victimization survey that you're, the, you're doing within the labor force survey, the personal safety survey, as well as the key findings uh, of the latest survey and the changes since 2016. Um, we'll now uh, have a little bit of time for some questions on uh, the last three uh, presentations. So for, for the participants, you can enter uh, type your questions in the Q&A um, uh, box, or you can take the floor if uh, you want. Uh, I am just looking now at the questions. I'm not sure we have. OK, we have a question uh, from Isad Zin Naim, who is probably addressed to uh, Australia. How do you decide on the sample of males and females? Is there any risk if you take 50% of males and females for a survey similar to the personal safety survey. Sure. Um, so that's probably more of a policy question. Um, our samples are designed based on uh, what information needs the government need to measure changes um, to measure policy progress. So the personal safety survey has a larger female sample because there's a need for more information for females. The crime victimization survey, on the other hand, is um, because it's based on the labor force survey, it's about a 50-50% uh, split between male and females. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other questions for, for now. So maybe participants can continue entering their questions in the Q&A box, and uh, we will take them at the end of the meeting. Um, so I would suggest now we move to our last presentation, which is from uh, Martha and Kain, uh, Martha and Kind, uh, from uh, UNODC, who will present on uh, the importance of administrative data and other types of data uh, for monitoring or measuring uh, gender-based violence. Martha, uh, you can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Um, yes, uh, good morning from Vienna. Uh, as David said, my name is Martijn. Uh, I'm a statistician with UNODC. And together with David, I work on our crime statistics um, that is that are primarily, um, oh, sorry. Um, we need to share the screen. Um, I have a colleague who was supposed to share the screen, but it's not working. So could somebody else uh, put the presentation on the screen, please? Yeah, I'll do it. Thank you. So, um, so far, we've primarily been talking about survey data, um, singing its praises. Uh, so I would just like to take a moment to talk about administrative data to highlight some of the potential uses of administrative data and why administrative data can actually also offer a lot of added value also for in the field of gender-based violence. Um, I don't see the presentation yet, um, but on the first slide that I'll, I'll show in just a second, we'll go back to the figure that we saw yesterday in Jessica Gardner's presentation and this morning again in the first presentation by our colleagues. Um, there it is. Um, I see PowerPoint. Thank you. Right, so we've seen this uh, this figure a few times already, um, and I just wanna wanna take a step and just look at it one more time. Um, so if you could just press next twice. So um, we have. Okay, yeah, there we go. So we have the actual prevalence of violence that is uh, in society. We can't measure the actual prevalence. There will always be some missing data. 
but we can get to the disclosed levels of violence. These disclosed levels of violence we can measure with gender-based violence or crime victimization surveys or, or some other kind of survey. Uh, and then you can see the smaller uh, circle in this, which is a reported violence. This is the administrative data that we've been talking about. Um, uh, but within that, you can also see, we can see specific information on sentenced violence. So we can also know, okay, so how much of that is actually sentenced through the formal criminal justice system. Uh, and this can also provide some important information. And as you can see, there is a large degree of overlap between the kind of data you can collect through surveys, but there's also a small area that's unique to administrative data. And I'd just like to highlight that in the next slide. Um, so as you can see, the orange area here is the overlapping area. Essentially, that is data that is captured by both administrative data and survey data. And as you can see on the right, um, there is what we call the dark figure of crime. This is what is captured by survey data, mostly, um, but not by administrative data, because people simply uh, don't report uh, everything, every crime to the police. But this is something that we can capture using survey data. So like I said, it's crimes that are not reported to the police, crimes that are potentially not recorded by the police, or um, crimes that are actually recorded as minor offenses rather than actual criminal offenses by the police. However, there is also another important area that you can see all the way on the left where administrative data actually captures some data that surveys cannot capture. Um, this is particularly relevant um, in the case of gender-based violence because while it may be a small portion of the total data, it does capture um, homicide data, for example. Uh, and this is particularly important here because it will include uh, the data on gender-related killing of women and girls or femicide, which cannot be captured in another way. Um, and one of the other um, data points that we can capture with administrative data is, of course, uh, victims that are below the age of uh, the minimum age for the survey, whether that's 18, 16, or 15. Um, these kinds of data will not be captured in a survey because we generally don't interview children, but this kind of data will be captured by administrative data. So there are definitely advantages to also uh, focusing on administrative data to get a full picture of gender-based violence in your country. Um, so on the next slide, you can just see the kind of administrative sources that we're talking about. Um, since I work for UNODC, I will mostly be focusing on the criminal justice system, um, but there are other sources of administrative data that were also discussed yesterday. So I won't talk about all of them, but I just want to highlight a few brief examples. So we also know, for example, that in the civil justice system, that performs family law functions, um, we know they sometimes issue protection orders to prevent the offender from having contact with the victim, for example. We can use that kind of data as well. Uh, we know that from the health system, we can use medical records to identify women that have been treated in medical facilities to track uh, gender-based violence trends as well. And there are lots of other agencies that are also um, producing administrative data that could be relevant. Uh, a common example is, for example, public housing services. Uh, these will often help victims of domestic violence find temporary shelter or more permanent alternative housing. Um, some of the specific uh, gender-based violence data that we're interested in is, of course, uh, first of all, the victim-perpetrator relationship. So does the victim know the perpetrator? Is it an intimate partner? Is it a relative? Um, is it someone's friend? Um, is it someone who's completely unknown to the victim? Um, and of course, we also would like to know more about the context of the crime, where did it take place, what time, et cetera. Uh, and we want to know some more about the description of the victim and the perpetrator, the type of violence that was used, and so on and so forth. Um, so these more specific variables um, have to, of course, be standardized uh, to be able to be useful in administrative data. So we'll talk about this more tomorrow during the presentation dedicated to the new statistical framework uh, on the gender-related killing of women and girls that's been jointly developed by UNODC and UN Women. So I won't go into detail on that here today. So um, on the next slide, you can just get a brief overview of uh, the criminal justice process. We at UNODC typically recognize four distinct phases in this process. There is, of course, a great deal of variety in how this works between member states, but generally, mostly roughly, um, member states follow this process. So um, we have a first point of contact, the police, 
These are ultimately the ones who report the crimes and investigate any allegations of criminal conduct. They gather the evidence and they file charges. Here, this is where we can probably get the most useful administrative data for gender-based violence, but I would argue that also data that's collected from prosecution, courts, and maybe even prisons also holds uh, valuable data. So at the prosecution level, of course, uh, we, we, they are provided with the evidence, they prepare cases for court, and they actually go to court. And then in, in courts, we have judges who hear the cases uh, and determine ultimately whether somebody is, uh, should be found guilty or acquitted. Um, so if we speak about criminal justice statistics in the next slide, um, the kinds of information that can be collected is related to the kinds of criminal acts that are involved in the offense. We can get specific details about the victim, about the offender, about the circumstances, but also information about what was the final decision. Um, did prosecutors decide to go forward with the case? Um, did judges typically, um, do they actually sentence offenders or, or do they just get off? Um, do people go to prison for these crimes? But also more managerial information, such as how many people are actually working in, on, on gender-based violence in the, in the judicial system? Is there a specific gender-based violence unit? Uh, if so, how well is it funded? How many people work there, et cetera? So um, in the next slide, we'll talk about how, how we can use some of this information. Uh, well, like I said, there's, there's an operational aspect to it. So we can know um, how we can deal with specific crimes. So on an operational level, we can see, okay, where do these crimes tend to happen for gender-based violence? Is it a specific time of day, a specific area of a city? Um, what is the typical profile of an offender or the typical profile of a victim? These can all help the formal criminal justice system uh, fight these kinds of crimes. But there's also a more managerial aspect to it. So we can know, okay, how well is the criminal justice system performing in, finding, in fighting these sorts of crimes? We can also measure staffing levels. Like I said, we can see how much money is dedicated to, to fighting gender-based violence, how many crimes uh, are reported, how many of those are solved, how many are left unsolved, et cetera. Um, and of course, all of this information can be used for research and policy development. So getting these highly detailed information can help us better understand uh, trends and patterns and ultimately help us design better evidence-based crime prevention policies. So speaking specifically about police statistics in the next slide. So like I said, these are typically, they are the first point of contact for most, most victims if they decide to go to the formal criminal justice system, of course. So it offers a complete picture of reported crime. But of course, as we said in the beginning, this is only reported crime. So it doesn't necessarily mean that this is the same as the, the trend in the underlying phenomenon. So we, we can't capture the full universe. Uh, for this, we need complementary data like uh, crime victimization surveys, but at least within the reported crime, you get very detailed information. So um, this includes reliable information on the offender and oftentimes also on the victim. Uh, but we need to note that gender-based violence isn't always correctly classified. So that could be problematic. And it's of course also influenced by the willingness to report of victims. Um, as we know, there can be any number of reasons why people actually don't report gender-based violence to the police. For example, it could be considered a personal issue that needs to be resolved privately. Uh, perhaps people don't believe the police will do anything about it. Uh, there could also be a fear of retaliation, etc. Um, so all of this information together can really help us design better policies and also allow us to monitor progress. Uh, for example, the data can reveal how many women were victims of intentional homicide and how many of these can actually be classified as femicide. So moving on to prosecution statistics, um, there can also be interesting information here. Uh, for example, we can have an idea of attrition with gender-based violence. So it's, it's, of course, we will always have a certain level of attrition, meaning not all reported cases are prosecuted, not all cases that are prosecuted um, end up with a guilty verdict. So there's a natural rate in that because obviously not everybody's guilty, 
but it might be that we see an elevated rate for gender-based violence, for example. So if we have, uh, for example, 100 reported cases of gender-based violence, but the prosecution only files charges for 20 cases, um, we could be interested to learn, okay, why is this actually the case? Are they dramatically understaffed? Um, is there a lack of evidence or are they unfamiliar with the topic uh, and not sure how to proceed? So this could just be a lack of training or sensitization of staff members. And then administrative data could give you an indicator of this, but of course, further probably qualitative research would need to be conducted to provide the conclusive answers to these questions. Um, another indicator that can be very relevant for gender-based violence that I quickly want to note here is the length of proceedings. Um, so of course, particularly for gender-based violence, we want to help victims in a timely manner. Uh, if procedures are very lengthy, it can actually expose people to additional harm. Uh, and it also lowers people's willingness to rely on the criminal justice system in the future. It will be seen as an ineffective and inefficient way of dealing with the issue. And of course, you want to prevent that. Um, so uh, briefly on court statistics, um, the most useful information here, I think, is whether certain measures were taken to protect the victim, um, whether there's compensation, but also sentence details. So what happens when somebody's prosecuted for gender-based violence? Do they pay a fine? Do they get a slap on the wrist? Or do they actually have to serve serious time in prison? I can give you an idea of the kinds of consequences um, and how seriously the, the criminal justice system is committed to fighting this kind of crime. Um, okay, then I briefly want to mention some of the advantages of using administrative data in the next slide. So um, one of the advantages of, is, of course, that it is collected in the day-to-day -day business of these agencies. So it means that the data can be collected at a much lower cost. Uh, I am, would be the first one to acknowledge that doing surveys is incredibly helpful, but these are also a rather expensive way of collecting data because we have to develop questionnaires, we have to design our samples, we have to contact respondents, we have to process the res uh, all the responses and verify them, calculate the results, et cetera. So usually the running costs of administrative data sources are significantly lower and access to administrative data sources in the public sector is often free of charge. Um, there's also usually a higher time, uh, higher frequency uh, for administrative data. So um, administrative data sources that are not based on any particular time period, such as um, those that record incidents like criminal offenses, they offer a lot of flexibility here and you can allow, you can produce statistics for any given time period and you can even look at it on a daily basis, for example. Um, we also have a, a improved timeline, timeliness. So um, yeah, one of the disadvantages of statistical surveys is that they generally take a lot of time to plan, design, et cetera, whereas administrative data is of course available in real time. Uh, but of course, that being said, there are also several challenges associated with administrative data. Um, oftentimes there is an incoherent use of statistical concepts and definitions. Um, so we really need strict standardized protocols that is, are followed by all the involved actors um, so that they all register the same variables, use the same codes and the same response uh, items uh, and apply the same definitions. Otherwise, administrative data is not as useful. Uh, ensuring cooperation between data providers can be very difficult. Uh, we, of course, always need to think about data protection as these are very detailed personal data points usually. So we need to take into account the relevant privacy and confidentiality laws. Um, there are sometimes also inconsistencies between different sources. Um, and of course, uh, the last point, it's not really a challenge. It's more of a constraint of administrative data. We missed a dark figure of crime with administrative data. So we don't capture the full universe of it. Okay. Um, I am running a little low on time, so I'll skip this example. But the next example, I can show you that through administrative data, we can also get a better idea of um, the kind of perpetrators that commit this kind of violence. We have two data examples here from our own uh, CTS data collection from Mongolia and New Zealand. And you can get a better idea of what is the relationship between the victim and the perpetrator. 
Um, in New Zealand, for example, we see that the relationship is often not known. And in Mongolia, it, over 80, uh, almost 80 percent, we can see that the, the perpetrator is known to the victim. It's either um, a friend or a family member or an intimate partner. I would caution against direct comparison of countries, but just to give you an idea of the kind of data that you can collect here. Um, and then maybe we can just skip to the example from South Korea, sorry, Australia. <laughs> so this is another example of the kinds of uh, administrative data that you can use. So we know, for example, in the Republic of Korea, based on information collected by the Supreme Prosecutor's Office, that there were almost 33,000 sexual assault cases in 2021. And on the left chart, you can see, um, we can plot the time of occurrence. So when is it most likely to occur? We can see, perhaps not surprisingly, that they most often occur during the night. And we can also see the victims by age group. And you can clearly see that the largest age group is the 21 to 30. But perhaps a little disturbingly, there are also victims that are uh, younger than uh, 16 and even younger than 12. Um, then just a brief note on some guidance that you will notice is developing. We have, hopefully you've all heard of the International Classification of Crime for Statistical Purposes, but we're developing some additional guidance for criminal justice institutions on the kinds of data that they should ideally be collecting to be better able to respond to crime. Uh, this goes beyond offense data, and it also includes data on the kinds of activities they do day to day, the kinds of resources they have available, et cetera. So we'll have three different guidelines, one for police, one for prosecution and courts, and one for prisons. One for police has already been released. The other two will come in the future. And in addition to that, we're developing a fourth guideline that focuses on the how. So how do we build a statistical system based on administrative data that can inform policy? Um, I think I'll, yeah. So uh, if you want to see the police guidelines, they are available now. Please use the QR code and have a look. Um, and I think that's it from my side because I am out of time. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, just, okay. All right. Are you still seeing my presentation? Or the presentation, sorry? Yes, we can still see your screen. Mm. Um, Yeah. Okay, now I think I stopped sharing. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Martin, for your presentation. Uh, see, we have, so we have now 10 minutes for questions. So for those of you that still have questions, you can uh, put them in the chat. I saw that uh, already a number of questions were answered by our presenters and speakers today. Uh, we have uh, someone who raised um, their hand uh, the first one is, I think, a participant from Russia or Central Asia. Um, so I'm asking you to, to I mean, if you can uh, ask your question, uh, we'll probably need to change on our side to put the uh, interpretation in English. Okay, maybe this. No, this is an accidental hand. Hello. Um, yes, hello. Uh, thank you, thank you. And uh, it's a very informative uh, presentation. Uh, my question from David and also Martin, that in, um, belong to Pakistan. And mostly here is the uh, department's uh, data issues, mostly in the GBV cases uh, on DREP and the domestic violence case is not reported. Then how uh, we face uh, lots of challenges from departments. How can we solve this resolution? Also, police and the health department uh, doesn't know how to report and how to collect data and uh, dealing with mostly uh, victims. I can, I can try to yeah. answer that. Yeah. Um, so um, regarding the, the training, I, I don't have a direct answer to that. I think that's for some of the colleagues who are more specialized in gender-based violence. 
But in terms of collect collecting data in a more consistent way, the first recommendation I would make is try to implement the international classification of crime for statistical purposes in your country. This will allow police prosecution, et cetera, to use the internationally agreed standard for, for recording crime. And it also allows you to, in addition to just recording a crime, it allows you to record lots of disaggregating variables. So for example, uh, the age and the sex of the victim, the age and the sex of the perpetrator, the location of the crime, et cetera. And these are all standardized. And an important one is also that it allows you to record the motivation of a crime. So you can select, gen, uh, it's a gender-based motivation just to get a better idea of whether or not the crime is related to a gender-based violence uh, motive. And um, in terms of uh, other recommendations, we are working on this fourth guideline that I just briefly alluded to that will really go into more depth on how to develop an administrative data system and how to ensure data exchange is, is, is taken care of how do you consistently record metadata, et cetera. So that's coming in the future from our side. Thank you very much, Martin, to promote our work. Um, I can maybe try again um, for the participant that raised their hand. Um, okay, we have a question from uh, Yuan Mei. Um, please. Hi. Hi, I'm Yuan Mei Wang from Malaysia. I have two questions. Uh, first, I would like to know whether United Nations have a mechanism to speak to our member states um, about the level of data that we can collect, because what you have shared with us is country-specific data. Seems like it's at the national level. What about district level, religious level, or even rural urban uh, uh, level? That's number one. Number two, from the country-specific data that you have shared, there was a big uh, difference between New Zealand and Mongolia in terms of the trend of the data, the pattern of the data. For instance, in the context of whether sexual violence happened in the context of relationship or non-relationship. Uh, so then at UN level, when we interpret the data, there's different pattern but when it come to interpretation, the framework, uh, what are the development that we are at at UN level in terms of coming up with feminist interpretation framework or cultural framework or framework related to religion, et cetera? Thank you. David, do you want to take this one or should I? Yeah, yeah I can maybe uh, respond for, for the first part. I hope I put it correctly. Um, in terms of the data to collect, so at the UN we are promoting the, and, and it's basically the member states who have agreed on uh, monitoring the SDG indicators. Uh, so there are a number of indicators uh, related to uh, violence, uh, for example, the prevalence of sexual uh, violence or uh, of harassment. Um, so this is a framework that the countries have uh, agreed to uh, to. Um, to follow and uh, to uh, to uh, collect data for. Uh, there are also a other number of uh, data collections that the UN has uh, with member states. For example, uh, in UNODC, we have our annual crime trend survey that we send to all member states. Um, and it's basically for member states to report data mostly on, on crime, but I think that includes the, some of the data that uh, Martin presented previously on uh, the number of victims of, for example, sexual violence. By sex and age, um, I believe, and maybe my colleagues from uh, UN uh, Women or UNDP can uh, intervene. But there are also uh, another number of uh, data collections that are done by the UN. Um, for us, it's very important that uh, the data we get uh, from the member states is uh, is standardized. That's why Martin insisted on the, some, of, and, and the other colleagues insisted on some of the guidelines. But just making sure that uh, all member states are using the same definitions. Uh, and that's very true, especially when uh, talking about administrative data, uh, since uh, a lot of the data from the criminal justice system is um, following the legal definition. So for us, we try to have some common definitions between countries. Um, Martin, I don't know if you want to take the, the, the question yeah. in New Zealand versus Mongolia. Yeah, so I think the second part of the question was comparison and some of the data that we showed, so very different patterns. Um, here is where I would place a, a very huge caveat that uh, 
these data are very good for uh, monitoring trends within countries, but directly comparing countries is, is not recommended, uh, especially because not all countries have implemented, for example, the, the international classification of crime for statistical purposes. But beyond that, we also know that countries have, have very different counting rules. So uh, until all of those practices, if ever, are, are standardized internationally, uh, comparing countries directly is just not feasible. Thank you. Um, I don't know if there are any uh, other questions uh, or if some of our presenters uh, also want to take the floor maybe to, uh, to respond to um, or to add more on their presentation or to respond to questions they saw in the chat. Oh, I see um, a question from uh, Dulam Jeff. Altangeren. Um, please, if you want to ask a question. Can you? Hello. Yeah, thank you. For, uh, thank you for very informative uh, presentations. I'm. I, my name is Ertin San, and I'm, uh, in, uh, I'm from NSO of Mongolia. And just I wanted to say that there's, uh, we are you know, a few words on the gender uh, gender based violence survey, how we are conducting it at the NSO of Mongolia. We are, uh, in 2017, we conducted gender based violence survey with support of the UDP and Swiss Agency for Development and Corporation uh, and the government of Australia. The, also, the, this year, we are going to conduct the, the um, crime victimization survey. Uh, this survey also will include the, the, the uh, indicators related to the violence against the women. And so, uh, that's why we are, uh, uh, this kind of the uh, um, uh, this 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 issue is uh, this of the uh, how to say uh, very useful for us to to consider how to we conduct the include the, this. Uh, questions related to the violence uh, into the how to integrate this kind of the uh, survey with the with the gender based, based violence into the uh, crime victimization survey is very important do you have some sort of the questions relating to these issues the the, the uh, whether we need to just uh, uh, ask the few questions related to uh, violence against the woman or the more, more, uh, I mean, that is the whether we have to include few questions or more questions. It depends on the countries. Yeah, I'm sorry if you understand. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for sharing what you're doing and also for your question um, on, on the different, uh, on the length of the survey, if I understand correctly. Um, maybe, uh, Junko, um, I don't know if you got the question, but maybe you could uh, add uh, to that. I mean, that is the how to integrate the gender violence survey with the, the, the CVAs. Uh, Yunko, do you want to? Sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't quite um, catch yeah. the, uh, the question. Uh, it's how to integrate the gender based violence uh, module into the crime victimization survey. If you have best practice and recommendations on how best to, to, to measure gender based violence in a survey like that. Yeah, so thank you very much for the question. Yeah, so 
I, I think it's it's a matter of, there are several uh, factors that we have to consider in terms of the budget and the uh, expertise and the uh, country's commitment actually to, to continuously uh, push this. So maybe uh, establishing a legal basis will be a, a, a good start actually to have such a, a, a commitment to conduct the survey, to collect the data. And, and considering all those factors, maybe uh, if the budget is a constraint, because as I mentioned in my presentation, dedicated surveys could be very costly. So if you have existing surveys of a victimization survey, whatever, then you could add a module on top of it. Uh, and um, so whatever is uh, feasible with the given the resources and the, the, uh, the policies and legal basis available, I think countries need to uh, make a choice uh, based on those factors, I guess. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Yumko. Um, I'm, unfortunately, I think we need to uh, to wrap up now. We already uh, passed uh, the, the time. I see there are still a few questions from participants, uh, so maybe you can keep them for tomorrow. Uh, and uh, we will also try to respond to the questions uh, you put in your in the chat and we haven't been able to respond to. So tomorrow we'll uh, talk a little bit more about uh, femicides, so the uh, homicide or the gender-related killings of women and girls. And uh, we'll uh, also look at uh, innovative data sources to monitor gender-based violence. Um, I would like to thank you for uh, joining us today. I think it was great. Uh, we you know, would also like to thank our presenters uh, who did fantastic presentations and uh, I hope uh, you you learned a lot from this presentation. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, see you again tomorrow morning at the same time. Thank you again. Bye. Thanks, David. Bye. Thank you, bye, -bye. bye.